LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com My life fades, the vision dims, all that remains are memories. I remember a time of chaos, ruined dreams, this wasted land. But most of all, I remember the road warrior, the man we called Max. To understand who he was, you have to go back to another time when the world was powered by the black fuel and the desert sprouted great cities of pipe and steel. Gone now, swept away. For reasons long forgotten, two mighty warrior tribes went to war and touched off a blaze which engulfed them all. Without fuel, they were nothing. They'd built a house of straw. The thundering machine sputtered and stopped. Their leaders talked, and talked, and talked. But nothing could stem the avalanche. Their world crumbled. The cities exploded. A whirlwind of looting. A firestorm of fear. Men began to feed on men. On the roads, it was a white line nightmare. Only those mobile enough to scavenge, brutal enough to pillage, would survive. The gangs took over the highways, ready to wage war for a tank of juice. And in this maelstrom of decay, ordinary men were battered and smashed. Men like Max, the warrior Max. In the roar of an engine, he lost everything. And became a shell of a man. A burnt out, desolate man. A man haunted by the demons of his past. A man who wandered out into the wasteland. And it was here, in this blighted place, that he learned to live again. Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is John Michael Greer, who joins us to discuss his latest book, After Progress. Progress is not just a goal in the West, it's a religion. Most people believe in its inherent value as enthusiastically and uncritically as medieval peasants believed in heaven and hell. Our faith in progress drives the insistence that peak oil and climate change don't actually matter. After all, our lab-coated high priests will surely bring forth yet another miracle to save us all. Unfortunately, progress as we've known it has been entirely dependent on the breakneck exploitation of half a billion years of stored sunlight in the form of fossil fuels. As the age of cheap, abundant energy draws to a close, progress is grinding to a halt. Unforgiving planetary limits are teaching us that our blind faith in endless exponential growth is a dangerous myth. After progress addresses this looming paradigm shift, exploring the shape of history from a perspective on the far side of the coming crisis. Greer's startling examination of the role our belief systems play in the evolution of our collective consciousness is required reading for anyone concerned about making sense of the future at a time when we must seek new sources of meaning, value and hope for the era ahead. 
Hello and welcome, John, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, it's a pleasure to be back on. Now, today, John, we're going to be discussing your latest book. We've actually got a couple out, but we'll talk mainly today. We're talking about after progress, reason and religion at the end of the industrial age. Before we dive into that, just give listeners a little bit about your background and your work in general. <laughs> in two sentences or less. Um, <laughs> Basically, I've been, I, I think of myself as a dumpster diver in the back alleys of, of industrial society, um, intellectual, in their intellectual culture. Um, I am interested in the viewpoints that other people are not willing to talk about. And so, obviously, that brought me into involvement into various kinds of spirituality. But equally, it's had me interested since, since very early on, in fact, in the future of industrial society. Where are we headed and especially um, all the reasons to think that we are not headed in the directions that we like to think towards some you know, glorious Star Trek future metastasizing across the galaxy. All of that, both the spiritual dimension and the, um, the concern about the future of our society, kind of focuses in on this, this new book of mine. Of course, that's, that's not a new thing. I've done several books that deal with that in one way or another. But this one is really tightly focused on the issue of why do we believe the things that we do? What's going on when people in industrial society, people in anywhere, you know, whether in the United States and in Great Britain or where have you, um, where people in industrial society are convinced that the future must have some particular shape, why do they believe that? And what are the roots of that belief and what are the consequences of it? Yes, I would say this, um, this book, I've read all your previous ones on this general topic, and th this one certainly strikes a more philosophical note, shall we say. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, is, it's very easy to get caught up in the events of politics, of economics, of all this kind of stuff, and to lose track of the fact that all of these things are caused by people. All of them are caused by people's ideas, the, the beliefs they have about themselves and the world. And so, if you really want to understand what's going on in the world, you have to approach it from a level of of philosophical reflection, and even of, let's whisper the word, religion. Yeah, that's key, isn't it, really? Because although you discuss you know, the history and development of religions as well, you're pointing out really here that this is what we're dealing with, the same type of thinking mm -hmm. when it comes to mm -hmm. industrial society, when it comes to progress, when it comes to economic growth. It's exactly the same mm -hmm. mindset. It, exactly. And it's our, it's our great blind spot in the modern industrial world these days, that we don't see our beliefs as beliefs. Of course, that's very common. I mean, a superstition is a belief that you don't happen to have. And, and um, you know, when you talk to today's so-called rationalists, they're convinced that the word religion applies to everybody's beliefs but theirs. And this is actually fairly common. Many societies in history didn't don't actually have or didn't actually have a word for religion. It was just the truth about the world until they had to start dealing with other people who saw the world in a very different way. So our, our, our modern rationalists are kind of a throwback to that more primitive notion that, well, you know, our, our set of abstract and arbitrary beliefs about, about the nature of the world, the nature of human life, that's just the truth, and everyone else just has these bizarre superstitious beliefs. One of the trends that I have noticed amongst thinkers such as yourself dealing with these topics is that increasingly... Uh, I'm not saying you're doing this necessarily, but they're increasingly not engaging with politics and economics anymore because they're basically hitting their head against a brick wall. And they are starting to think about w what it is to be human, our consciousness, and as you say, why we think and then and why we do the things we do. Maybe that's a way in to uh, begin addressing mm -hmm. some of this. Yeah, I see that not not as a as a backing away, but as a recognition that you can't deal with something like the, the something like the predicament of our age on a level of symptoms. And talking about politics, talking about economics, important as those are, those are symptoms. And the causes are our attitudes, our beliefs about ourselves and, our, and the universe, our beliefs about what matters and what's important. Um, and that's also something where you, that that's where each of us can get in under the hood right where we are, right here and now. And that's that, to me, is crucial. One of the things that we've seen over and over again is people will be protesting the existing order. They want to say a no to the system, but they don't have any alternative that isn't just more of the same. 
And so often, in, in recent decades, protests have simply ground to a halt because all it can say is no, like kind of you know, like a two-year-old going, no, no, no. Okay, we need something more positive than that. Just raging against the system didn't do anything. But if you can change the attitudes that underlie the system in yourself, that's a crucial thing. You have to start with yourself. Figure out why you why you're acting in ways that support the system, even when you think you oppose it. Figure well, out why your basic assumptions are those that make the system seem logical and necessary. And then you change those, and you can start changing them in other people, and then things start to unravel very nicely. That's the plan, at least. <laughs> well, we can, we can but try. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was one of the frustrations that, um, that people expressed with the Occupy movement, that uh, mm -hmm. just, despite this long history of similar field operations that this was this time it would it was so big and it was so widespread that it was going to change things and then people were kind of like oh well you know that didn't work and, and it was almost like this stunned disbelief mm -hmm. well the, now there, there's a couple of factors there and the, the occupy is, is a really good example because on the one hand of course I think it, I think everyone pretty much realizes that the entire occupy thing would have dried up and blown away in five minutes if somebody had gone down and offered everybody there a comfortable middle class job. To some extent, the entire point of the Occupy movement was we want our share of the goodies. That's not a really good basis for a protest movement. <laughs> it's certainly not going to change things. Um, secondly, we, we're going to need to factor in the way that, ra that um, organized radicals on the left in, the, in modern times, since about 1980, have been stuck in a set of hopelessly self-defeating organizational patterns. This fixation on consensus, okay? Now, I know the, the people who, who, are favor, who are in favor of consensus say that, well, you know, consensus stops the majority from tyrannizing over a minority. And they're right, because consensus permits a minority to tyrannize over everyone else. One person who refuses to, with an agenda, who refuses to go with the flow, can literally bring a consensus thing to a screeching halt and keep it there permanently. And so you get the kind of stupidities that we saw over and over again in the Occupy movement and so many other things where everything comes to a screeching halt while, while people sit around dealing with process. And of course, people sooner or later get bored and realize that nothing is happening and trickle away. And of course, that's what happened. But those two factors, first the fact that a lot of what drove Occupy was simply a, a desire for a share of the goodies rather than any actual desire to change the system, and the hopelessly dysfunctional consensus systems that are being used by radicals, those are over the top of the awkward fact, as I see it, that most of the people who think they're protesting the system have values and belief systems and understandings of the world that are indistinguishable from the ones that define the world, that, that, that define what they're trying to protest. I know people in the peak oil scene went to various Occupy um, activities and tried to talk people about limits, tried to talk to people about, um, well, you know, there aren't limitless supplies of energy. There isn't enough for everyone to live like the 1%. And they hit a blank, an absolute brick wall of denial and rejection. No, no, the only thing that's wrong with the world is the 1% is messing things up for us. If the one percent wasn't doing X, Y, and Z, we'd have all these consumer companies. The, 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 the whole crux of your book really is this idea that progress is a sort of sacred cow, and that mm -hmm. um, it must advance in a straight line, more or less upward. It might plateau occasionally, but it's headed in one direction. And for me, th this has always seemed a bit absurd because I took the you know I made a comparison, say, with economic growth, and I just thought, mm -hmm. well, you know, nothing grows forever. It's not possible and if it does what does it look mm -hmm. like it'd be one thing mm -hmm. if we lived on uh, you know an infinite planet if such a thing could ever <laughs> exist you say, mm -hmm. but but, mm -hmm. but we don't so but and even somewhere like the occupy movement you, know, you might have expected some of the more switched on radical people with ideas coming from you know out of left field but then say that progress and we can't all have air conditioning and a freezer full of uh stakes or whatever it happens to be and then it's it, it that doesn't that seems to again and that's what it hints that's where it locks in with this idea of it being a, mm -hmm. a, a religious thinking process mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah it, it seems it seems crucial to me to realize that 
progress is a surrogate religion for people who stop believing in the Christian God, but still have the same emotional needs that Christianity used to meet. That's what it's been. I mean, if you take progress, take the word God and substitute the word progress in all of our rhetoric, all of our religious rhetoric, and you'll find things that people like Neil deGrasse Tyson are saying all the time, that progress is this, you know, infinite beneficent force that is eventually going to bring about this wonderful world. You know, it's the second coming in science fiction drag. And... You could you could just about sing, you know, uh, progress loves me, this I know, because Neil Tyson tells me so, or something like that. It would all work. And that's because belief in progress is a religious faith. Now, it's what the, this, this is one of the places where the rationalists blow a gasket, because they insist something. You can't have a religion without deity. Okay. Sociologists have been talking for decades about what are called civil religions which are basically ersatz religions, um, ideologies that fill religious needs that don't actually happen to have deities. Um, communism was one of them for many, many years. People put their faith in Marx the way a, a devout uh, Southern Baptist here in the States puts their faith in, in Jesus. And in the same way, progress is a civil religion. It is, um, it, it is, it is a blind faith. It has its theology, you know, it has its, it has its glorious, you know, uh, destiny in the future. It has the the horrible curse of superstition and primitivism from which um, the great God progress is always saving us. It has all of these things, and it fills the same emotional needs. You can tell this. It's suggesting that it doesn't happen or suggesting that it's a temporary phenomenon and that progress will be followed by regress. It's like trying to tell a medieval peasant that God and his saints and in heaven aren't there anymore. The emotional reaction you get is absolutely the same. And it's, it's really quite colorful to watch if you don't mind, um, you know, absolute rejection and, and dogmatic hostility. Well, of course, we can think of progress as we're discussing it, perhaps embodied by post-war America, uh, you know, during the, the 50s and 60s, and the great mm-hmm. material and technological advances that were made at that time. Mm-hmm. People seem to be, on the whole, doing better and better with each passing year. That was always intended to somehow fan out across the globe. But where, mm-hmm. we, where we find ourselves now is that uh, while uh, the U.S. has been waiting for the rest of the world to catch up with it, it, it and you know prosperous parts of Europe, it's actually started to recede on the home front. Well, yeah. Well, it actually started to recede in 1972. Um, that which was not coincidentally the year that um, domestic U.S. petroleum production peaked and began to decline. Since 1972, for the, the lower 80% of the American population, the standard of living has declined steadily year by year by year. And that's something you cannot mention that in American politics, by the way. People will just will give you that blank look, the, the sort of thousand-mile stare you expect from a cult member, and just go on talking about something else. But it's one of the it's one of the driving forces of of American politics these days. But it's totally unmentionable. Amer- I mean, I, I don't know how many people realize just how bad things have gotten in this country. Um, when you know when, when I when I was growing up half a half century ago now, um, an American family with one working class income could afford a house, could afford a car got all the bills paid on time, um, you know, could even do the occasional vacation to Disneyland. These days, in most parts of the country, one working class in salary won't keep you off the street. We can no longer afford to keep our roads and bridges maintained. I mean, things are, things are amazingly tight over here. There's this facade of America as this vast, rich, powerful, you know, m- mightiest military in the world, blah, blah, blah. And increasingly, it's a shell projected by PR around a nation in free fall. And uh, I don't know how many people outside of America are aware of this. I'm pretty sure that people in certain capitals, I'm thinking here especially Beijing and Moscow, are perfectly well aware of what the actual score is, and that's why they're, getting incre- they're, they're pushing increasingly on the edge of the shell. Well, of course, in general, unless somebody's doing some kind of road trip or making a documentary, people like me who visit the States, uh, we, don't go to, mm-hmm. we don't go to rural hinterlands or we don't go to to cities that may be hollowed out. You know, we go to the places where tourists go, you know, <laughs> and, th- and things are deliberately kept uh, looking, mm-hmm. you know, spruce and things for the visitors. You don't want to send out the wrong message. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and, and it, you know, it, it's reminiscent of the Potemkin village in, in, in you know, the in Stalin or Soviet Union, where you have this this one shiny little village where all the foreigners who visit and see how everyone's happy and laughing and well fed as they bring in the as the, the commune brings in the green, and they're not allowed to go anywhere else. Of course, you know, you don't even have to forced people, you don't have to barbed wire, you just, here's where the tourist attractions are. And yet, if you get in a rental car and you drive 10 or 15 miles in any direction, you suddenly start seeing the real America. The real America is, a, you know, is, is increasingly a third world country. Well, of course, from an outsider's perspective, things looked pretty good in the 1980s for the US. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, by comparison, we would, look, um, I'm a big fan of 1970s movies, you know, US movies, and uh, mm -hmm. you, you look at the state that New York was in at that time and, you know, it was pretty grim and there were other cities like that. So it must have been, perhaps it was cheaper technology, perhaps it was Reagan's policies, but something kind of kept it, the appearance of the party going, certainly in the 1980s. Okay, well, what happened, of course, was that um, this, this, was, this was something that Reagan and, and Thatcher and several other leaders of that same conservative, pseudo-conservative stripe worked together on. Um, you had the North Sea. We had the Alaska North Slope. In both cases, both countries took a resource that could that should have been stretched out over decades and pumped them full tilt, flooded the market with crude, and that in com in combination with the various conservation things that had been put in over the previous decade, crashed the price of crude oil. Okay, and that produced a bubble of false prosperity. Because a lot of what made the 70s difficult was simply the, the rising price of energy. Energy, everything you do in an industrial society depends on energy, and most of our energy comes from petroleum in one way or the other. So once they crashed the price of crude, they were able to temporarily make things look very shiny, especially here in the United States. And there were some other things that were involved in the same process, um, primarily in the United States, a matter of absolutely reckless borrowing. That's when, you know, the, the, the Republicans took power uh, grumbling about the tax and spend Democrats and be, and turned into borrow and spend Republicans. We went from um, having a very modest national debt to having the, the kind of national debt, the kind of annual deficits that we've got nowadays that are just stunningly huge. Can you imagine anyone making a TV series like Dallas now? <laughs> just just the, the, uh -huh. the, the sheer excess and overdrive and it has, mm -hmm. And it's Gordon Gecko as well, isn't it? Greed is good. It was just that was exactly, exactly. And a lot of it, you have to remember that the that this was that was the time when the baby boo generation was in the process of selling out here in the, here in this country. We had we had our boomers. Um, you know, these were the, these were the the youth of the 1960s. A lot of them were involved in the environmental movement in the 1970s. And by the 1980s, a lot of them were looking around at the the prizes being dangled before them by the, um, you know, the, the powers that be, and looking for an excuse to sell out, to, you know, put on the suit and go into the corporate job. Um, I recall a, a poster that you could get at the end of the 1970s that had, I think it was, um, Woodstock um, Festival, 20-year reunion, and everyone, all the guys were in suits and all the women were in, you know, um, party dresses and everybody had martinis. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so you had basically uh, that the the the, the boomer generation cashed in their ideals, and that was when they were doing it. And so that kind of wallowing in excess was very comfortable at that time because it you know you could convince yourself that that yeah that's what I want. I mean that's when Madonna was singing you know singing about the mater you know material girl and all that kind of stuff. It was it was a rejection of the values of the of the previous period of the of the era of the hippies of the era of the environmental movement's great successes, and yeah, now it doesn't wear so well, and people are start people are very uncomfortable with it. But the damage has been done. The thing is, in the 1970s, there were so many steps taken that could have resulted in a smooth transition to a world after petroleum. And in you know, with the Thatcher Reagan counter revolution, those those went away. Those were you know, the the, um, the solar panels on top of the White House were torn down and thrown away. And um, presidents stopped wearing sweaters to stay warm, and so did everyone else. 
And so we backed ourselves into the, into the world that we're in now, which is a considerably harsher place. And I think people are beginning slowly and uncomfortably to become aware of that fact. Now, you mentioned the 1970s here, but in particular about declines happening in standards of living from 72 onwards. And this should remind everyone, this is not new. Uh, in fact, the period that came after that, you described the Reagan Thatch thing as more like a blip. And we've discussed this before. Uh, in 1974 was the year that uh, this guy, Robert Ovaca, put out his book, The Coming Dark Age. And you pointed out, of course, mm-hmm. how wide of the mark he was on many things. But I read that in 1984. And I was only mm-hmm. a teenager at the time. And of course, I, I didn't have the information, the data to say how wide of the mark this was. But I could see a lot of it was plausible if certain things went in a certain direction. And mm-hmm. even then, before I'd even had my first job, before I'd even left, to- left home, I was thinking to myself, what did we think was going to happen? How did we think this was going to end? And it all boiled mm-hmm. down to essentially people didn't know. They could see that this was a sort of a one-way track. But... It was always off in the future that any problem that mm-hmm. came up, technology would fix it, the boffins would come up with something. Yeah. So it was all basically, mm-hmm. we didn't know what we were going to do down the line, but we just said, well, somebody will think of something. Or that old, yeah, old yeah. the other popular one, oh, well, I'll be dead by then. Well, I'll be dead by then. And that's, that's one of those basic confessions of moral bankruptcy. You know, I'll be dead by then. I'm, pl- you know, my lifestyle is plunging the world into misery, suffering, starvation, and, you know, I'm creating a miserable, horrible life for my grandchildren, but hey, I won't have to see it. And it, it amazes me that people, you know, people can say that with a straight face and not hear themselves and not so, not say, what am I saying? What am I thinking? Yeah, I mean, this issue came up when I mm-hmm. when I interviewed uh, James Howard Constler, and it was mm-hmm. that th- you know I noticed that I don't have children myself, and uh, mm-hmm. I noticed how people's thinking is affected, particularly if they do have children, because on the one hand, yes, you wonder, don't they ever wake up at night in a cold sweat, going, "My God, what are we doing?" But it's more like mm-hmm. they they can't, in some in some cases, go down that road because they they can't imagine their children living in a tin shack or something like that, you know, their grandchildren mm-hmm. perhaps, you know, they just can't, they feel that what... And, and, yeah, yeah, and because they can't, because they refuse to imagine that they're pursuing courses of behavior that are making that happen. It's really quite an astonishing tangle. Yeah, I mean, I do have, I kind of put, what's the word I'm looking for? I do have sympathy and to some mm-hmm. extent for people in that position because it is difficult mm-hmm. to countenance doing less, having less for your, your, you know, descendants. It's, it's just because it's not what we, we've all grown up with so far. Mm-hmm. And yet not that long ago, it was absolutely standard. Not that long ago. It was people, you, you, you heard about millions of people. It was, it, that, in fact, that was the old version of the American dream. I'm going to work hard and save and scrimp so that my children can have a better life. That was practically the national credo. And yet we've gone from that, for, and, and you know, and that was something you heard all, all over the industrial world. It was standard, you know. Maybe I won't have all these things, but my children will, and I'm going to work hard and and and, and scrimp and save and not and not burn through everything I've got so that my children can have a better life. It was just normal, and we've gone from that to well, I'll be dead before it happens, and that's where you see the the. The selling out, the immense ethical failure of our age, the unwilling, the, the the transition from what was really a normal, healthy, you know, yes, I need to build a better world for my children, to the I've got mine, Jack. Sorry, kid, you're on your own. That that basically structures today's world. When I occasionally discuss these issues with people that are considerably older, you know, you know my parents' generation. Basically, mm-hmm. there's quite, particularly those that are comfortably well off, you know, middle class mm-hmm. or upper middle class mm-hmm. lifestyles. There's difficulty for them to grasp the, some of the realities, even for people of our age, but never mind people who are 20 years, 30 years younger than us. And, uh, mm-hmm. it's like, so your house isn't paid off? It's like, no, it's not. I can't afford that. You, have you got a pension? No, I can't afford a pension. Like, oh, okay. When's the last time you went on holiday? I can't afford to go on holiday. And they, they, because they're basically doing well, they almost like pull the ladder up, if you know what I mean. And it's very, oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of cognitive, cognitive dissonance from people like that, I think. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and and I think one one of the things that's going on at this point that is rendering things very very difficult is precisely that we're kind of rationing by generation. Any given generation, you know, the, right now the generation that's that's retired or that's just on the edge of retirement, the people who are, for example, in power right now, who are mostly in their 60s or 70s, um, their, their generation is still getting the bulk of the goodies. And the generation that comes after doesn't get quite so much, and the one that comes after doesn't get anything like so much. And we go on down to the, you know, to, to the kids of today who are going to be left with nothing. But because each generation focuses on its own experience and very often doesn't like to talk about, you know, what about the, what about the kids in their twenties right now? Um, it's easy to pretend that everything's okay. Yeah, and what we see now on the political scene, and and, and also amongst the so-called experts that politicians wheel out, uh, you know, mm-hmm. economists, um, energy consultants, all that sort of thing, is even as the kind of signs of things coming undone are ever more prominent, their denial and insistence that the only way is up become ever more shrill. And we're just coming up now in a couple of weeks or so. Well, next month, there's going to be a national UK election to elect a new government. Mm-hmm. And despite, and they're all trotting out the same slogans, but I have never seen a, a, a political scene in more disarray than uh, mm-hmm. the one now. And I've been watching this since, you know, since the early 80s. Mm-hmm. It it does seem. Well, I mean, I as as, as an outsider and but one an interested outsider, I've watched. I've been watching the British political scene to some extent since about the same time, and it does seem very confused and very very much as though people are brandishing around slogans that they don't even believe in anymore. And well, it's it, frankly it's very reminiscent of of our political scene right now, except that you have more parties. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, I mean, I do wonder perhaps if, uh, in the UK anyway, um, you know, th- things are so polarized in the States that I can't see, uh, a coalition anytime soon. But I do wonder if we're going to enter an era of permanent coalitions here in the UK. Cause let's not forget, there's quite a few European countries that have been running coalitions for decades, you know, and, uh, yeah. but it's not, I, not always I mean, a good has, thing. Exactly. Has, uh, has the, has the, gov- has there ever been a majority government in Italy, for example? I believe it's, you know, or these days these Germany is always a coalition um, government pretty much. And that's, that, that, you know, th- that can that can happen. There are countries that have survived that way for a very long time, uh, as you say. Um, in the U.S., we don't have that option because of the way that our, our political system is set up. Since it's not a parliamentary system, um, somebody's going to end up in the White House. And it doesn't matter if, you know, well, as in our current situation where Obama the Democrats have a minority in Congress, but Obama's still there until his term is out. And so we get even more creative forms of gridlock where, you know, where you have, as present, the Congress ruled by one party and the White House by the other, and so nothing, nothing can get done. Or, as happened, as was until recently, one House of Congress is, is in the hands of one party, one is in the house of the other party. And, and even below that, below that, these more, these very obvious things, there are all of these pressure groups, all of these groups that have enough clout to veto something that they don't want, but maybe not enough to push something through. And so we have a, a national government that really has not been able to do much of anything except hand out giveaways to big corporations, which is most of the business of the, of the U.S. government these days. And that's, that's very little, very nearly all that it does. You discuss history a great deal, and uh, this book, the new book, is no exception. And uh, you've been pointing out, uh, don't you, blue in the face, that uh, we do actually have something to learn from history, uh, good and mm-hmm. bad. But there seems to be, you know, just sort of a blindness in that respect. And I'm thinking here specifically mm-hmm. of the, the arc of civilizations. Uh, but mm-hmm. of course, it goes back to what I was saying earlier: is that this time it's different. You know, it doesn't apply to us. All that, all that stuff that's applied to everybody who ever lived ever. Doesn't mm-hmm. apply. Doesn't apply to us. Exactly. Well, the the use. I, I'm going to have to do do a blog post one of these one of these days on my blog, the Arch Druid Report, about thought stoppers. And a thought stopper is a is usually a one sent a single sentence. It's simple. It's straightforward. It's clear, and people use it to, so that they can stop thinking. Um, it's different this time. That's a classic thought stopper. 
they'll think of something. That's another one. Um, they listen to people talk about politics, about economics, about the future, and you can it, very quickly you realize that it's just the same bunch of, of sentences being regurgitated with no more thinking than, than you know, Pavlov's dogs required to be caused to drool. Somebody rills, rings the right bell, and everyone starts saying, you know, they'll think of something. It's different this time, <laughs> like a bunch of sheep. But, yeah, there, I, I, I've really come to think that a lot of, there, there's something going on in our collective, science, collective psychology these days. It's hard to describe without using words like cult. If you've ever met people in one of those really high pressure, um, you know, religious groups that that get called cults, they have the kind of thousand mile stare, and their conversation consists entirely of quotes from you know the the guru or the master or whoever, and they're just kind of disconnected from everything except you know guru's grace says that this is this is fine. Um, I hear that all around me these days, and it's focused on progress. It's as though progress has gone from being a religion, being a religious cult, being this kind of completely detached, arguably psychotic belief system that has nothing to do with the real world and everything to do with this sort of fantasy world that people have inserted themselves in. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, how, how else to describe it, but it is really weird. Um, you talk to people about what's happening, not even about the future, about the fact that you know, they can't get a job, that it does that, that, that all of the you know, the, the, for example, you know, when an economist, well, here, here's here's what's becoming a common joke these days. What do you call an economist who makes a prediction? Go on then. And the answer is wrong. <laughs> Seriously, if you look, go go back go back through the, the newspapers or the websites and notice all the predictions made by economists. You will have to look long and hard before you find one that turned out to be right. When an economist makes it, opens his mouth, he's wrong. It's just it, it's that simple, and yet people still insist on taking them seriously, because and and treating the the utterances of economists as though they mean something. It is it, it is weirdly cult like behavior, and increasingly, uh, you know, I'm. I'm putting a lot of thought into what is driving this. Why are people that fixated on a belief system that is failing them, a belief system that is making their lives measurably worse day by day, and yet they, the you know the the worse things get, the tighter they cling to it. It's really quite fascinating. I bumped into a couple of Mormons the other week. They came up mm -hmm. to me in the street as they want to do, and they asked me, "Could I recommend?" Uh, an American restaurant, and I was like, I don't, what is that anyway, McDonald's? You know, <laughs> I don't know. What, <laughs> but I got chatting to them anyway, and I, the reason I mentioned this is because they're perfectly nice guys. I think all Mormons are nice if you talk to them in the street. But they, mm. were, they, were, they were somewhere else whenever we got off topic. You could see their, mm -hmm. their, their eyes were empty. They were kind of looking over my shoulder, and they were gone. You know, And I, that's exactly the sort of reaction you can almost feel it you can almost sense it in the air when you talk to someone who's very uncomfortable with this information that we're discussing mm -hmm. you know they really just it's one of those social situations they just kind of want the ground to open up and swallow them they just want to be somewhere else you know think happy yeah, thoughts yeah, yeah. yeah think yeah think happy thoughts um we were talking about the early 1980s that was when don't worry be happy was all over the place i used to call that the valley and national anthem <laughs> Of course, it's all uh, keep keep calm and keep calm and carry on memes now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, don't keep calm. Um, I, I would I would encourage all of our listeners: don't keep calm, don't carry on. Let yourself panic. Let yourself feel what you're actually feeling. Let yourself see what is actually going on around you. Don't keep calm. Don't carry on. Go do something else. Because what you're doing is dragging you down. Uh, I think we pointed this out in a previous interview we did around your book, uh, Green Wizardry, that really, mm -hmm. if we're waiting for top-down solutions, top, we're, remember that not every problem has a solution, but if we're looking for yeah. top-down stuff here, we need to kind of mm -hmm. just give up on that, really, um, because we're going to get the same old, same old 
even as things gradually mm-hmm. get worse. And you emphasize on an individual level, if we can come to terms with this in our hearts and in our minds, then mm-hmm. doors begin to open. There are ways that we can change things individually and in small groups, mm-hmm. you know, friends, family. Uh, we can make a and difference. Builds, yeah. And it builds from there. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But it has to start with the recognition that um, pro- the great God progress is not going to save us. They won't think of something. It isn't different this time. Deal. <laughs> and once you grasp that, once you grasp that industrial society has backed itself into a corner with no way out except straight down, that it's not going to get better, that it's going to get worse unless you yourself individually do something about it. Once that realization happens, as you say, doors start opening. There are enormous options out there. But as long as you remain stuck in the cult of progress, singing Progress Loves Me, this I know, as I did as I did earlier, you're trapped. In fact, you're doomed. Because everything you're being told is telling you to, to stay where you are and keep doing what you're doing to stay, you know, to uh, keep calm and carry on. When the ground is opening up beneath your feet, I think, uh, apart from posting my interviews on the website, I also mirror them on YouTube just because a lot of people mm-hmm. pass through there. I think the best, mm-hmm. perf- best performing clip that I have with you up there is at about 25,000 views. Now, obviously I'm a tiny one man operation here. Um, still that's not bad, but you can, well, the, the, I think the point is I constantly look at this in dismay is that you can put up a video of a, a kitten, uh, being cute, or you can mm-hmm. put a video of a dog falling off a log and you'll get a million views in 24 hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, that, but that's fine. People are using that. That, that's the, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the anesthetic. You know, cute kitten pictures or dogs falling off logs. All the stuff we use to fill our minds to keep ourselves from noticing. The fact that 25,000 people are actually taking the time to listen to one of, to, to one of these, these shows and go, wow, okay, at least they're grappling with the idea. And 25,000 people, that's a lot. I mean, it, it picks up, and you you got your, as you say, your one-man operation. I appear on various other places. My my own blog gets about a third of a million um, ind- um, individual page views a month. And so it is slowly making a difference, and it's making a difference where, it's ma- where it matters in individual people's lives and in the lives of families, in the lives of small communities. That's where social, that's where real change actually begins. There's a couple of headline topics here I want to dip into because for me, they're, mm-hmm. very, they're a very rich source of information about our predicament uh, how, and how we mm-hmm. think and how we go about things. One of them, which is getting a lot of attention at the minute, is fracking. Oh, it was just a whole se- scene across there in the U.S. You know, America is going to be energy independent in whatever how long, and, and there are <laughs> exactly there are. Um, that's quite the laugh there. <laughs> there it, over over here in the U.K., you're probably aware this is a, a process that's just getting underway now. You know, the, the political mm-hmm. lobbying and the brown envelopes full of cash and all the rest of it are starting to um, get that process underway. And there's a lot of hype around it, but uh, fracking is great because. It's where the energy and the economic issues c- converge very dramatically. Mm-hmm. Really, we have, we have a lot to learn by studying it. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing to the thing to be aware of about the whole fracking bubble, and it is a bubble, by the way, is precisely that it's not about producing oil and natural gas. It's about producing um, securitized debt that can be sold. It's a way to make money off the financial industry. Um, the fracking industry in the United States, most of the big companies involved in fracking have never turned a profit during the entire period of the fracking industry. They've been going billions with a B of dollars into debt every single year, drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling. And even when, even when crude oil was a hundred dollars a barrel, they weren't even breaking even. It's not a, it's, and if this reminds you of the housing bubble, if it reminds you of the tech bubble, yes, that's exactly what it is. That's all it is, is another speculative boom being driven by, on the one hand, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, people who like running speculative bubbles are perfectly willing to sell you, um, you know, uh, adjustable rate mortgages or stock in pets.com or, 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 or fracking laces, knowing that you're going to end up losing your shirt. And on the other hand, so many people are desperately trying to find a way to make it big without actually earning money. Um, 
you know, by investing in this or that or the other, whether it's pets.com stock or whether it's um, real estate, um, you know, um, mortgage mortgage backed bonds or whether it's in this case the the amazing amount of financial architecture that sprung out of the fracking thing. What you've got going on in Britain is simply an attempt to, to by the um, the financial industry in London to run the same scam there and get you know billions of pounds of, of uh, you know fracking bundled fracking leases and volumetric production payments and all these other pieces of financial architecture that can be sold to investors. And you know the fact that it will crash and burn shortly thereafter is not you know nobody in this in you know, in the London financial scene has to worry about that. They'll have sold the thing and walked away, just as they did in the real estate bubble, just as they did. I don't know. Did you, did you, did Britain get much into the tech stock bubble back around 2000, 1999, 2000? I don't recall, um, cause I wouldn't have been looking as closely back then. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I certainly wasn't, and I've never been invested in the stock market. So I wouldn't, have, you know, way. yeah. So I, I can't honestly say, but I don't see any reason why not with London being such a big financial center. Yeah, uh, maybe it didn't hit so many individuals, but yeah, people would have, uh, you know, pissed away millions, no doubt. Oh yeah, yeah. And so, um, so yeah, basically at this point, we don't have an economy in the United States. What we have is a bubble blowing machine. Um, there's very little goods and services actually produced in the U.S. these days. If you subtract the financial portion of the economy, it's, it's actually, you know, again, a third world country. But blowing bubbles is profitable. And the fracking thing is just another bubble. It's just like the housing bubble, except they're they're using the real estate in a more destructive fashion instead of having, as as we have here, acre after acre after acre of abandoned housing projects that nobody will ever live in and nobody could ever have lived in. Um, We have acre after acre after acre of fracked real estate where the water is poisoned forever. (laughs) Oh, well. Um, It doesn't actually produce that much oil and gas. I mean, it's produced, it's produced a nice little spike in the United States, and, but the thing about fracked wells is that they run dry after a few years. They don't keep producing for 20 years the way an, an ordinary oil well does. You get, you get this rush of oil and gas, and then it drops off by as much as 90% of the first year, and it keeps on dropping. So it's very well designed to produce a rush of cash. You can show the, the you know, how much is coming out. It looks really great. And then you, you sell it and you walk away and, you know, the goose stops laying golden eggs very, very promptly. So I, I you know, to the extent that um, Britain can avoid having, you know, some of its real estate permanently poisoned by fracking fluids, that would be a good thing. Um, one way or another, it's not that the United, the United States is not going to become energy independent through fracking. It's what it's going to do is get itself another really nasty recession, which will probably begin in the second half of this year possibly right around the beginning of next year. Um, if, Britain can, if, if Britain can avoid going down the same idiotic road, that would be nice. Other than that, you're going to get some pieces of landscape where you can't drink the water anymore, and you're going to get another um, bubble and bust. Well, one of the and issues... Yeah, yeah, quite. I mean, one of the issues we have in the UK, which somewhat differs from the US situation, is that uh, we're more densely populated and we have less wilderness-type space and mm-hmm. I looked at the map of Britain, which shows the potential fracking hotspots, and a lot of them are in the southeast, and that's where our rulers live, and that's where the money is concentrated, and that's going to present something of an obstacle, I think. You know, you've got a lot of wealthy, influential people who Ooh. don't want it in their oh, backyard. Oh, how fun! <laughs> so you can get, the, you can get the, the wealthy, influential people who are backing fracking, and the wealthy, influential people who are saying, not in my backyard, and you get them, fight each, you get them to fight each other. Yeah, that should be fun. Yeah. They just tire each other out and then give up and go away. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the other topic that I wanted to throw in here, which you also address, is in general we've been talking about this sort of faith in technology that basically can, no matter what the problem happens to be, technology will fix it. Even energy, where we run out of energy, we'll have mm-hmm. technology instead. Mm-hmm. And this, perhaps, perhaps the zenith of this tendency of this blue sky thinking is transhumanism. And I've got to the point now where I used to be interested in what transhumanists were, and I'm generalizing here about them as a group, but you know, the Ray Kurtzwells mm-hmm. of this world. I used to take, listen to what they had to say with interest, say, um, that sounds difficult to achieve, you know, but now it's, for me, it's, um, it's comedy. <laughs> you know, listen to it. The, the other day I read an article that, uh, 
all these farms in China are going to have, or in India rather, uh, they're going to be farmed by robots, which will be much better, at, you know, doing the jobs that farmers otherwise do. <laughs> you know, stuff now, like that. Now, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's um, on the one the, the the whole transhumanist, um, the you know, what's it, the singularitarians, and so on. You've got this this marvelous mixture of outdated cliches from 1950s science fiction on the one hand, and straightforward borrowings from religion on the other. Uh, Ray Kurzweil's thing about the singularity is a classic example. Every single detail in it can be taken straight out of a Southern Baptist sermon on the Second Coming. Okay, You just have to put it into science fiction drag. Instead of Jesus, you've got super intelligent computers. Instead of um, heaven, you've got outer space. In instead of the, the glorified bodies of the elect, you've got the robot bodies that we're all going to have our consciousness uploaded into. Blah, blah, blah. Point for point. Um, I think he, I forget what date he set that, you know, he's got his, for his techno rapture. But it's just the same thing. And it appeals to people precisely because they've still got the emotional needs that a, a good Southern Baptist sermon will, will satisfy for a Southern Baptist, but, you know, people who don't happen to believe in deities are, are forced to find something else like imaginary um, hyper-intelligent supercomputers to believe in instead. And you get this robot thing. I mean, come on. Already, we've seen this immense amount of offshoring of labor, of, of, of factory work to third world countries. Why? Because they don't automate. Because it's cheaper to hire a human being than it is to put in a machine. Uh, we, you know, in, in China, in Indonesia, in Singapore, what have you, in India. Nobody's going to pay for robots to farm fields in India when you can do it with people. Because people are cheaper. People are cheaper to manufacture. They manufacture themselves. Um, people are cheaper to fuel. They're cheaper to, you know, the, the energy input you need for a robot involves very specific kinds of, of, for example, very specific voltages and amperages and so on of electricity. Uh, for a human being, well, we eat a lot of things. <laughs> That's our fuel. And so on down the road, our maintenance needs are much simpler. Economically speaking, it's absurd. But the whole point of the, of the transhumanist thing is to pretend that economics don't matter, thermodynamics don't matter, the limits to growth don't matter, the, the world is flat, and so it has infinite resources, and so we can imagine that if we can come up with a picture of it on our iPhone, it must be real someday. And you, this leads on nicely, actually, actually, to the subject of science in general, which you tackle in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the thinking mm -hmm. of scientific mindset. Again, not being critical here, but it's just you know trying to be objective mm -hmm. about it. And that faith in technology leads to um, a lot of stuff being done. You know, a lot of blind alleys. When in fact we could do, mm -hmm. we could do with talented, intelligent people trying to actually yeah. deal with some of the, with the real issues we do have. Exactly. We, I mean, how many billion, how many billions of pounds, how many billions of euros are going into um, the the fusion, the the big CERN fusion thing? Okay. They've got this immense rat hole down which they're pouring millions upon millions of euros a year, which will, if the, if everything goes well, take us one small step closer commercial fusion. Now, what, what nobody is asking is, if it costs this much to build a reactor, how can we afford to have fusion power at all? And, you know, okay, when they get it, if they ever get it to work, and, you know, again, they've been promising sometime really soon for the last 50 years, if they get it to work, it will probably cost less, you know, the, the, the final production reactors will cost less than the experimental thing. But if, the, if this thing that's only taking us one step closer is going to cost us, what is it, 17 billion euros and rising? Um, nobody on Earth is going to be able to afford electricity at that price. It doesn't matter if they achieve nuclear fusion at this time because nobody can afford it. Nobody can afford to pay their power bill. So instead of continuing to throw money down that rat hole instead of continuing to pre to push on dormant pull. Um, yeah, the, there's a lot of brilliant people who are involved in the quest for nuclear fusion. All of those people could be doing something useful, but because fusion has been, um, you know, has been crowned with the laurels of the next great step in progress, they keep on doing it. They keep, and they'll keep on doing it until industrial civilization drops out from beneath their feet because they can't see that progress 
is just a label that we use for certain kinds of social changes. It's not a force of nature. It doesn't happen by itself. There is no guarantee that it's going to happen. And in fact, many, in many things, I mean, well, here's an example, uh, Concord. Well, remember the, when the supersonic plane was the wave of the future. How's that doing? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, all the rhetoric that used to be, that, that, that is now being used for things like nuclear fusion or what have you, was being used for the Concorde back in the day. And even when the, you know, the, the consortium that was, that was putting it together, their own economists were saying, look, this is, this is idiotic. There's no way this will ever even pay for itself. But no, no, we've got to go ahead with it. And well, it never paid for itself. It was a creature of subsidies. And it, you know, oh well. Nuclear fusion is a creature of subsidies. That's a nuclear power generally, fission reactors. The only countries in the world that have them are countries that fund them with massive government subsidies because they don't break even otherwise. Yeah, that leads me on to another little thought experiment, mm -hmm. which, um, I don't know where things stand at the minute with, in respect to the costs of oil, you know, how much oil you use extracting oil. But I'm wondering mm -hmm. if it came to the point where, let's say, it, you had to use one unit of oil to get one unit of oil or you know, gas or whatever it happens to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. At that point, would they stop producing it? Well, I don't think so because they have to, mm -hmm. they have to keep, the oil has to keep flowing somehow. And then if you got to the point, where it takes 1.1 units of energy to mm -hmm. get to get one unit. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm thinking here, because of the, the mass psychology here, that they would go on burning through the energy, energy even faster just to keep barrels of oil appearing. Well, but the, the problem here, of course, is that oil at the wellhead is not all that you have to pay for with that, the energy that you're getting. Long before you get to a net, uh, an, an energy return on energy invested in euro, E-R-O-E-I, which is not quite an E-I-O, like McDonald's farm, but close enough. Long before you get to the point where you're, you're burning one barrel of oil to extract one barrel of oil, you no longer have the spare energy to keep the refinery running. You no longer have the spare energy to drive the tankers, the, the tanker trucks, or run the um, tankers across the oceans. You no longer have the um, spare energy to build automobiles or even to maintain them, and so on and so on and so on. So actually, once we drop below about, nobody's quite sure, of course, because it hasn't happened yet with petroleum, but the working guess that somewhere between eight and ten, eight, a return of eight and ten, you reach the point that the system starts falling apart because it no longer produces enough energy to support itself. So, and that this, this is, this of course, overall, you can prop up a failing resource using another resource. But the whole, the tar sands thing in, in Canada right now, um, that's actually a roundabout way of burning natural gas. They're basically, they're, they've got a lot of natural gas. They are burning it at a breakneck pace because you have to put all that natural gas into roasting the tar sands to extract the tar. So, and, and turn it into something more or less approximates crude oil. So they're actually, they're, tar, tar, tar sand in and of itself would be completely uneconomical. You'd have to burn more energy than you get back from the tar, but since you've got the natural gas to burn, they're, they're, they're kind of finessing it that way. Fracking is exactly the same way. Um, the total energy input into a fracked well is probably more than you'll ever get out of the well. But because we have energy from other sources, we can play that game for a while. But once we get to the point that across the board, the total return on all of our energy sources is somewhere like eight to ten times what it costs on average to, in terms of energy to extract energy from those resources. Once we pass that figure, the system starts breaking down because you no longer have enough energy for maintenance, repair, replacement of parts, maintenance of the necessary infrastructure, and so on. How close are we to that? Heck of a good question. Nobody knows. Well, I was going to ask you to speculate along these lines. I mean, you, for example, spend a lot of your time documenting uh, problems in these areas. Uh, you, you'd be mm -hmm. someone who would say, we have no shortage of uh, examples of what we're talking about here. But of course, the, the media, the mainstream media and the general populace do, do a very good job of not paying attention to it. What might be mm -hmm. a couple of significant tipping points in your mind? Again, we're not saying these are predictions, but what sorts of things would occur in energy, environment, economy, whatever it happens to be, that they, and as the, things the, get close to that, that they could not ignore. Point. 
basically that can't be ignored, where people will have to sit up and pay attention, or will will that possibly never come because it's a. Uh, uh, I, I don't. I don't expect that to happen. I, I think. I think probably most most people in the industrial world will go to their deaths, convinced that it's just a temporary crisis, or that. It's all the faults of those those dratted liberals or those dratted conservatives or you know somebody or other that it, it, it's somebody's fault, um, or I just don't know what's happening. I expect that those words will be on men, will be the last words on many people's lips, because I mean at this point in the United States, as I mentioned, we've had this drastic decrease in standards of living. We've had our infrastructure is falling apart. We've had one of the one of the real warning sirens that we've had is a steady decline in the consumption of gasoline since 2006. It's ratcheted downward steadily. Why? Because so much of the national wealth has to go into producing and buying energy that it started, basically things are starting to break down. It's exactly this problem. We may be getting near to that fracture point where we can't afford to keep society running again because we don't have the net energy to do it on. And yet, it's, you know, people are turning their backs on all these things. They just, you know, <laughs> keep calm and carry on, pretending it doesn't matter, it's not happening. And I, I, I honestly think that 50 years from now, we could, be, we could be living here in America in a society where most people no longer have electricity, no longer have running water, um, no longer, the, the population is half what it is today, um, People are living in, you know, tin, in the equivalent of tin shacks made of salvaged, um, salvaged scrap from, from defunct suburbs. Um, cars are luxury items for the very, very rich. Nobody's seen an airplane in a long time. And people will still be insisting that we'll be going, we'll be back, going back to the moon any day now. That everything's just, just, you know, this is just all just temporary. It's part of the creative destruction of capitalism. Everything is just fine. Well, with this belief in progress, and um, it leads people to do what you call in the book provisional living, what I call like the death of the present moment, because people become lost to the yeah, future. Yeah. And I think even on yeah. a, a a modest level, that we whatever's happening in the world around us, uh, we we, mm-hmm. lo- we lose a lot by being off in the future sometimes, because wh- whatever shape the world's in, we're right here, right now, and um, we've got lives, and yeah. there, there still are good things happening. There's art and beauty and mm-hmm. love, and you know, yeah. And and saying, well, I'm going to put all of my thought, yeah, as you say, the death of the present moment, I'm going to fixate entirely on, you know, what's going to happen when the singularity comes, what's going to happen when, this, when Jesus finally shows up, or what have you. Um, or just progress. And just living living in this dream world where things are getting better. Yeah, you, it, it, it's superficially very attractive, because you don't have to deal with the fact that the world's going to hell in a handbasket around you. But the downside, of course, is that you lose all, all of your authentic opportunities for, for joy, for love, for creativity. Because you're, 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 you know, sitting, you're spending all your time in a place that doesn't exist. Yeah, because as have you, you have pointed out before that even in the depths of the Dark Ages, people, you know, boy met girl, people had families, yeah. people made things, you know, they, they, they laughed, you know, just that they, 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 they laughed, they sang, they said, they told stories, they, you know, they, they led fulfilled, in many cases, happy lives. Yeah. You don't need an iPhone to have a happy life. In fact, I tend to think that it's kind of an obstacle. Uh, but, but this, this is, this is another, another aspect of the same thing. And the, the way that people have invested their identity in the technologies they use. Oh my God, what would I do without an iPhone? What would I do without my, my internet connection? What would, well, maybe you might have a life. But, mm. but, but that, there, many, many, many years ago, and I, I may have to go digging to try to find that, there was a, a very famous psychological article about the, the account of a, of a, a child, a boy who was, like, like eight or nine or ten, I think it was, and had gotten into this really weird psychotic state. He was convinced that he had he had these, the, he was making these machines around himself that would live him. Okay, he wasn't living; the machines were living him, and they were, you know, made of the kind of things a seven-year-old would make them out of cardboard boxes and little pieces of scrap and tin foil or what have you. 
And he would insist on being surrounded by these machines all the time. And he had this really weird fixation for them. And it was a, a kind of an interesting look into the developing psychology of technology. He was simply an early adopter of our modern, uh, our modern internet-centered lifestyle. Nowadays, people do have machines that live them, do their living for them. You know, they're they're spending all their time online. They're spending all their time, you know, doing second life, virtual this and um, and you know, video game that, and exporting all of their own capacities into machines, or, or more precisely, surrendering all their capacities to machines and letting you know Apple and various other companies sell them back. Um, ersatz versions of the same. And so their entire life consists of matter manipulating machines and being manipulated by machines. And there again, you can do that or you can have a life. And I think one of the things that, that really needs to be talked about is the way that technology has served as a kind of neurotic focus for the assumption of an artificial identity that, that keeps us from having to grapple with where we actually are and what's actually going on in our lives. I hadn't planned to mention this, but you mentioned technology and how much it takes up of people's lives. For me, I'm not anti-technology whatsoever. If somebody can provide me with a useful gadget that will actually help me achieve something in my life better, I might be interested in having a look at it. But a lot of the consumer technology these days that's basically unnecessary has become so Baroque and Byzantine. I mean, I look at some of these, and it's not just because I'm an old fart, you know, I look at some of these new devices and I'm like, this, this does like a, a thousand and seven different things or something. And we, it's very easy to convince ourselves that we, we need these things, you know, and to the point where, uh, I'll, I'll quite often sit in a coffee shop and a group will come in, people together or a couple, and they'll sit down and start staring at their phones. They'll pretty much do that until they leave, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, but it's a, compl it's a complexity that gets me. This, these things are supposed to simplify our lives, but they get more complicated by the year. <laughs> No, labor-saving devices never actually save labor. It's, you know, you, you, you always have to factor in the labor that you put in to pay for them, the labor you have to put in to clean and maintain and, and manage them and this kind of stuff. Labor-saving devices rarely, if ever, save any labor. They actually make things much more complex. My favorite example of the, um, the, the sort of technology that doesn't actually do anything you can't do yourself, uh, what, what do they call it? The Wii, which is a gimmick for exercising on your computer screen. <laughs> and so you have these little electronic equivalents of like sporting goods, okay? So you have this electronic racket that you swing at an imaginary ball, and, and the computer screen shows how the ball bounces and blah de blah Why not just get a tennis racket and go out and play tennis? They have cool. people who are, you know, jogging through imaginary landscapes. They're sitting there going bum, 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 in their living room, staring at a computer screen, when they could be outside. It could be actually jogging. What's the benefit? Well, the benefit, of course, is that some corporation is spending billions of dollars to convince you that it's more important to do, that somehow it's better to do this on a screen. I, I, I saw, was it was in a laundromat the other day, killing time, and which is the only time I ever get into, into mass market magazines. The, there's usually a stack of them there. And they had an advertisement for a toothbrush that was connected to, via Bluetooth to your computer and to this website so that you could your toothbrush could like tell you whether you're brushing your teeth correctly and keep track of your toothbrushing and tell you how, how good your dental health was on a computer screen because your um, toothbrush is hooked up to the internet. And, and I said, you know, if some satire website had come up with that three years ago, we would have laughed ourselves silly. And here are the people in market, they're selling this piece of crap. Yeah, I think my, my favorite along those lines goes back many, many years. And I first saw one of these things in the 1970s. It was attached to the wall in a friend's house in the kitchen. And it was an electric can opener. And, the, the, <laughs> yes. you know, this, this, the, this thing, it worked for about six months. And then, of course, it broke. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it of was, course it broke. They screwed it to the wall. So they defaced the kitchen and it just sat there gathering rust. And I was just sort of like, <laughs> really? You know, some people have got too much money. Exactly. It's br bread making machines. That's another great example. I mean, ma baking bread is easy. It does not take that much work. It doesn't take that much time. It's a simple, wholesome, pleasant 
process that people have done for tens of thousands of years. But no, no, we have to have a machine where you measure in these, you know, you pour in the special ingredients and hit the button, and it all does it for you. <laughs> Yeah, but they're terribly, uh, terribly popular at the minute. But I find with things like that that they get purchased and they usually find themselves at the back of a cupboard pretty soon and they, you know, they go the way of all yeah. the, the other gadgets that you put in the loft. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, just in closing, John, today, uh, I've never asked you about your Druid faith and how that, infor mm -hmm. how that informs your life, how you live, how you see the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that'll be something very interesting about you that people may not know. I don't know if you care to share some druid perspective on the things we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, very simply, uh, druidry, however, the, the druidry is a very diverse um, tradition. For some people, it's philosophy. For some people, it's a religion. Some people never do explain. But it is. it centers on the idea that nature is worthy of reverence, however you want to express that. And if you start with the idea that what's natural has, you know, as, as we as we say these days, has evolved over millions upon millions of years, that it that it works, and that human tinkering with nature might not be anything like as clever as we think, especially you know once it has a time, once it has a chance to play out, it really does change your perspective because you then start looking at all the yammering about progress and how ooh we're going to get you know this marvelous that marvel there's enough marvels okay there's enough marvels in a in, in a square foot of grass in your back garden to keep you fascinated for a lifetime um, we don't need the toys the world actually is full of the, the world of nature, including human nature, you know, we're not separate from nature. Um, the world as it is contains all the joys, all the delights, all the wonders, all the opportunities for learning and growth that we could ever want. And yet people go running into these artificial um, idiocies. Um, again, you know, staring at, it, staring at a computer screen which is showing a, an animated image of a supposed landscape through which you are supposedly jogging as you sit there staring at the screen and, you know, moving your legs. It, 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 from a druid perspective, that's just dumb. And the only point of it, of course, is that some corporation is making money off you. And that's... So I, I'm not sure to what extent it's my druid perspective, my, my druid faith is um, reinforcing my um, my attitudes toward technology, or whether it's just a basic and an unfortunate excess of common sense that leads me to look at all this stuff and go, "Give me a break." <laughs> but but it all does kind of work out that way. Well, John, today we've been discussing your new book, um, After Progress. You've also got another collection out called Collapse Now and Avoid the Rush. Those are widely, widely and easily available. Tell folks about oh, yeah. your blog, however. That's well worth a read. That comes, that's every week you do that. And, yeah, uh, <clears throat> and anything else you'd like to share, including, uh, I know you're running a sort of writing competition at the minute for the latest edition of uh, uh, an anthology. Yes. So just share anything at all you want with the listeners. Okay. Uh, basically, the, the competition, a couple of years, a few years ago now, I ran a competition for stories set in the kind of future we're actually going to get, the one where no deus ex machina bails us out of the consequences of the links to growth. And I was expecting a few stories, maybe I, I got flooded with really first-rate stories, and so the first anthology came out after oil, is the title, after oil, SF stories of post petroleum future. Um, a while later, you know, it, it got published. Um, the publisher contacted me and said, you know, this is selling quite well. Would you like to do another? So I ran a second competition, and I got deluged. I got just flooded with a lot of really good stories. Two anthologies came out of that. Um, After Oil 2 is now out. After Oil 3 will be released fairly soon. And now we're doing another competition. Um, it's more stories. There, All the information is on my blog. More stories on... Um, set in a world after industrial society, after the limits to growth have clamped down, no, uh, you know, no uh, marvelous technological breakthroughs allowing us to ignore the laws of physics or things like that. Um, set in a real future, please. The one restriction this time is that the story has to be set a thousand years in the future or more. So I'm expecting to get some really wild stuff this time. Um, generally, deindustrial fiction seems to be taking off. I, I have a novel out called Star's Reach. 
There are a couple of other novels in process. I know people are, are um, looking at publishing them. And various people are starting to look, you know, instead of taking this the sort of canned, generic, done-to-death, frankly, science fiction future where um, it's all about spaceships and ray guns and, all, again, all the stuff that's been being done to death since the 1950s. What if we set a story in the future that we're actually going to get? What if we set a story in a future where industrial society does what civilizations do, declines and falls, and we have you know the aftermath of that, and we have new, new societies rising in a much more energy-constrained world with all the consequences of industrial um, society, things like um, nuclear waste dumps and toxic this and the climate change and so on. That's the future we're going to get. Why not write stories? Why not tell the tales of that future, which is what science fiction was originally supposed to be doing, you know? Um, it seems to be picking up, and I'm having a good time. I'm probably going to write another, um, I may write another novel uh, in that kind of setting as we proceed, but we'll see. And just once again to remind listeners, it's the Arch Druid Report. That's your blog, and people need to get themselves along mm-hmm. to that if they found this interesting. If you, if you punch in Arch Druid in pretty much any search engine, it's usually on the first page. Yeah, usually at the top, in fact. <laughs> Excellent. Well, <laughs> fairly often. Well, John, listen, thank you so much for spending time with us once again today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be on. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Based on current audience numbers, if everyone who tuned in donated just five pence per show, that's about eight cents US, this could become a full-time, fully funded operation, offering more and more often. During October 2014, over 50,000 of you streamed or downloaded at least one show. Total donations were seven UK pounds, which currently converts to about $11 US. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com. Legalize Freedom.